the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell is going on this week? Well, what the hell is going on is we have a really cool podcast today about Russian mercenaries. This hasn't gotten enough attention in the news, but it's a fascinating topic. So in 2018, there was a battle in Syria between American forces, American Syrian Kurdish forces, and a Russian platoon of mercenaries. And these people came in and tried to take a U.S. position, U.S. Kurdish position, and we absolutely obliterated them. There are hundreds of casualties. We used F-15s, F-22s, AC-130 gunships, Apache helicopters, unmanned drones, artillery, and we just blew these people sky high. And this battle has gotten very, very little attention. And as we were talking about this, we started looking into Russian mercenaries, and we found these people are everywhere. They're in Ukraine, obviously, and they, they were involved in the, in the taking of Crimea and in eastern Ukraine. They're in Libya. They're in Central African Republic. They're in Mozambique. They were providing security for Maduro in Venezuela. Uh, they, they were in Sudan trying to prop up the dictator there. There are Russian mercenaries all over the world right now. And until we started looking into this, I, I didn't realize how widespread this was. It's, it's a fascinating topic. If you think about it, this is the kind of thing that, you know, Vladimir Putin, in, <laughs> not in his guise as the hapless Dr. Evil, but actually as... as the know, actual Dr. Evil. As the, <laughs> as, the, as the actual Dr. Evil, right, would put together. I got to say, so, you know, we, we decided we were interested in this just to explain to everybody what this is all about. You know, Mark and I thought this would be a fascinating topic. We read a little bit about it. As Mark said, we did a deep dive to try to understand more about it, but... This is a mix of James Bond, John le Carré, the Americans. Tom Clancy. Killing Eve. All blown into one thing. All blown into one thing. I will say with a touch of Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, occasionally. But all of this is happening in national security. And, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty immersed in this topic. And I will say that I did not realize. I paid attention to that firefight in Syria, and I'll tell you why. I paid attention to it because what we had heard consistently from the Obama administration was, oh, we can't do anything in Syria. You just want to start World War III. Oh, we can't do anything in Syria. Do you know how powerful the Russians are? That, you know, if, if we take them on, this will lead to dum, dum, dum. And of course, then you read about this weird firefight in which we blow to smithereens some unknown number in the several hundred of Russians. And the Russian military response is, hoot to do what? Nope, nothing to see here. Thank you. Sorry. Bye. <laughs> Giving the lie to every claim that the U.S. government has made about why we couldn't do more in Syria. Well, I mean, the reason why you have a proxy army like this is deniability, right? So they go off and do something and they can get wiped out or they can, you know, get in trouble. And well, you say, oh, not us. We'd had nothing to do with it. So the Russians. But what, what was amazing to me, we knew that there were Russian mercenaries in Syria. We knew that they were in Ukraine. I was just amazed at how extensive their deployments are around the world. They're on multiple continents. They're, they're in 20 African countries. They're literally they're in Libya. They're backing two different factions in Libya at the same time, the same company trying to take over. And there's a strategic purpose behind it. They are trying to install somebody, either one warlord or another in Libya, with the goal of proving that the U.S. intervention in Libya backfired and democracy has been pushed back. So they're carrying out Russian strategic imperatives around the world, but they're doing it with this quasi-governmental, non-governmental, private army uh, that's out there. And the other thing that's really fascinating about it is everybody knows about the Internet Research Agency. Like the people, Oh, this is unbelievable. This is, this is just unbelievable. The, so the people who set up the troll farm in St. Petersburg that was interfering in the U.S. election in, in 2016, 
the troll farm is owned by the same guy who started the Wagner Group, which is this Russian mercenary army. So they've got troll armies going out and fighting information warfare around the world. And they've got an actual private army of soldiers that are going off and basically trying to make money, trying to mess us up around the world, push back on American interests around the world with plausible deniability, just like they've had deniability when it came to the information warfare right. in, the, in the 2016 election. And they're not just doing this in the United States. They're not just doing this in the Middle East, in the theaters that we've read about, Libya, Syria, et cetera, not even in places like Mozambique. They're also interfering in elections in Central Europe. They are trying to affect public opinion. These are the guys who set up Facebook pages to make it seem like people like Marine Le Pen in in France, for example, have tons of support, that there's really a groundswell of movement behind them. They're professionals at this. And I got to say, mercenary armies have existed for as long as time. Sure. You know, we, French we, Foreign Legion. Well, and that that's not even that far back. Yeah, and, still exists. Uh, right. The French Foreign Legion does still exist. That's right. Nice hats they have. But I don't think we know what to do about them. These are people who are, what do you call them when they're illegal warriors? Unlawful combatants. These are unlawful combatants, which yeah. is the same as basically what we call terrorists as well. well. You made an interesting point when we were talking about this, that this is very similar to Iran, right? That what Iran does around the world is they don't necessarily send Iranian military to destabilize countries. They have Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis and all sorts of different terrorist elements that they send out and they fund and they arm and they train them and they carry out as proxies Iranian foreign policy. It seems like Vladimir Putin has learned from the Iranians, who are, by the way, his close allies. It is basically mimicking Iranian strategy around the world by sending out these proxy armies to carry out Russian interests and to combat U.S. interests around right. the world. So the $64,000 question for us is, why doesn't everybody do this? You know, I think the Chinese We should are... have a private army, Danny. Yeah, well, if only we did. <laughs> God, I have so many priorities. Wait, let me, let's talk about that instead. No, wait, no, let's not. This is old Soviet-style disinformation. All you need to do is sow that seed of doubt in the minds of people as to whether... It's the government that did it or whether it's those mercenaries that did it. And if we can't decide who the bad guy is, whether it's in Beijing or the People's Liberation Army or whether it's Putin or it's his GRU, his military intelligence guys, not the cute guy from, from Despicable Me Gru, who I love, <laughs> but the evil Gru, if you can't decide who it is, then you're not going to be able to do anything about it. And as best I can tell, we have no policy to deal with this. No, we don't. And it's very, I mean, that's why people create proxy armies and proxy forces is because they can uh, do the fighting for you and give you deniability. So we have the perfect person to talk to about this. Uh, and maybe he'll help us figure out who these people are, what the Russian government is up to, and what the hell is going on. So Michael Weiss is an American journalist. He's an author. He's a senior editor for The Daily Beast. He works at a magazine called The Interpreter. And uh, he is really an expert on these issues. He's done a lot of investigative journalism about the Wagner Group and about Russian foreign policy, Russian mercenary activities, and just Russian naughtiness overall. I'm delighted to have him with us. <laughs> Michael Weiss, it's just a pleasure to have you on the podcast with us today. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking to you guys. This is an incredibly interesting topic, and I'm looking forward to diving into it. So, you know, if you were reading the paper last week, you saw stories about fighting going on in Libya and Russian mercenaries on the ground. If you've been paying attention, though, there was a firefight within the last year between U.S. forces and Russian mercenaries in Syria. 200 Russians, maybe even more, were killed. We hear, you know, digging down a little bit that there are Russian mercenaries operating in up to 20 African countries. Who the hell are these people? Well, they tend to go by the catch-all term Wagner Group. So named, by the way, because the commander who founded this group considered this an homage to the composer Wagner, the reason being that the composer was Adolf Hitler's favorite composer. So already not off to a great start, shall we say, in terms <laughs> of their ideological orientation. What's interesting, though, is I followed the kind of permutations and rebrandings of this organization fairly closely and, and in fact, discovered them even before they became what they now are. Wagner was, and, and I'll get a little bit into who actually finances them and controls them. Uh, a lot of this stuff has now come to, you know, the American public consciousness, thanks to the Mueller investigation and so on and so forth. But basically what happened was, I think it was 2012, maybe 2013, 
my team at The Interpreter, which was a, an online portal dedicated to translating Russian news content into English and then also doing analysis of the war in Ukraine, we came across this story in a St. Petersburg-based Russian newspaper called Fontanka. And the story was really bizarre, but also fascinating. It was about a group of private military contractors in Russia called Slavonic Corps, who were dispatched to Syria, the Holmes province of Syria. And what was described was a cross between the Keystone Cops and I don't even know. I mean, it was a complete and utter military calamity, um, really bordering on farce. Uh, these guys had their asses handed to them by what were then, you know, Islamist and pretty battle-hardened rebels. And they came back, tail between their legs. Some of them, among the rank and file, were prosecuted because technically mercenary groups are criminalized in Russia, although we'll come to the reality versus the, the technicality of that as well. And, you know, the patrons or the founders of Slavonic Corps one of whom had very clear ties to the FSB, which is Russia's domestic security service, I think went to prison. Well, lo and behold, a couple of years go by, the war in Ukraine really heats up, particularly in Donbass, and suddenly mercenaries are now flooding the zone, except now they're not Slavonic Corps, they're called the Wagner Group. And now, as has come to light through reporting and U.S. intelligence and European intelligence disclosures, this whole operation has been financed and overseen by Yevgeny Prigozhin. And Yevgeny Prigozhin is euphemistically referred to in almost every American news article as Putin's chef. Um, and and, and he, he, is actually, he is actually involved he in is. the food business, isn't he? Well, you know, <laughs> my favorite line, you know, I don't know if you guys saw the Stephen Pagal movie Under Siege, but, you know, the line, I also cook, that's what <laughs> I, I use about Mr. Prigozhin. You know, yes, he made his money in the catering industry in Russia, but, you know, look, he's known to be one of the members of Putin's inner circle. He is a, a, an oligarchic crony, probably also to some extent a bagman or somebody who is carrying money or holding money and assets on behalf of the Russian president, as so many of these guys are. But he has another claim to fame, doesn't he? He did two very important and arguably historically decisive things. One, create this Wagner group, which, as I said, they, they really cut their teeth fighting in Russia's dirty war in eastern Ukraine. They were then dispatched to Syria and, as you mentioned, suffered a, a catastrophic loss. But the second thing that Mr. Prigozhin did, which everybody now knows, is he founded the Internet Research Agency, or the IRA, which has been responsible at least according to Mr. Mueller, for really pumping all of the disinformation and propaganda into the U.S. electoral system, uh, or the U.S. electorate, I should say, in the lead up to the 2016 presidential elections. I mean, this is the so-called St. Petersburg troll farm. So he, so started, he started a troll army and a real army. He started a troll army and a real army. And both of these things are interestingly interlinked in the sense that, you know, any kind of kinetic or, or hot activity undertaken on, on behalf of the Russian military, or in the case of Wagner, a very clear cutout of the Russian military, has a component of information warfare or active measures. And, you know, there is some evidence that the troll farm has been, uh, shall we say, pumping out political information packages that dovetail neatly with what the Wagner group is doing, whether it's Ukraine, Syria, Mozambique, Libya, Central African Republic. I mean, these guys are, are everywhere. So what more do we know about the Wagner Group? Wagner's headquarters are in Krasnodar in Russia. And the training camp is located, I believe, right behind a GRU Spetsnaz training camp, Russia's military intelligence service. It's actually known as the GU now, but everyone still refers to it by its, its old acronym, GRU. This organization, very often conflated with the KGB, has actually been independent of both the KGB and its two successor services, the FSB and the SVR. In fact, the GRU is essentially founded by Leon Trotsky, the founder of the Red Army, in 1918. It just celebrated its centenary. But basically, what I'm given to understand is there is absolute continuity between the past and the present with this organization. So the KGB was shattered into a million pieces after the collapse of the Soviet Union and then sort of reconstituted and, of course, came into its own with 
with Putin's rise into the presidency because he was a former KGB case officer. But the GRU really operated uninterruptedly. And in fact, you know, you can go back to the 1990s when counterintelligence and domestic security services in Western Europe, their primary concern about Russia was, apart from weapons proliferation, organized crime. And they kept banging on about the fact that Russia's military intelligence is still up to their old tricks. They're still planting caches of weapons and communications devices all throughout the European Union and NATO countries. Why? What are these GRU guys all about? Well, going back to its raison d'etre, the GRU was founded, as one Western spy told me, to prepare for Russia's imminent or forthcoming war with the West. And that that goal, that remit has, has been unaltered. Now you hear about them in relation to the hacking of the DNC their cyber operations, again, world historically decisive intervention in a foreign country's domestic political affairs. You hear about them running essentially, I've, I've just now, as you guys called, finished a, an essay about Putin's murder incorporated all throughout Europe. They're running operations to kill defectors from their own service, such as Sergei Skripal in Salisbury using the nerve agent Novichuk. They have been credibly linked with the attempted assassination of a guy called Emilian Gebrev, who's a Bulgarian arms dealer who I just interviewed in Sofia, Bulgaria, who survived. Michael, this all sounds like a John le Carré novel or a, uh, you know. It really it, does. It, I mean, I have to say, you know, it's better than the Americans. It's better than killing <laughs> people in terms of the dramatics of it all. And yeah, I mean, it, it sounds almost implausible until you, you just look at the evidence and say, well, no, these, somebody's going around killing these people using military-grade nerve agents, WMD, which already shows a signature of some state actor. So the GRU is the boldest, in many ways the clumsiest, of the Russian security services, because, you know, rule number one as a spy, don't get caught. They get caught. But what I've come to conclude, and, and this is based on sort of my canvassing Western intelligence, counterintelligence opinion, the reason that they continue to operate this way is even in their failures, there are smuggled in successes. So for instance, Sergei Skripal survived this assassination attempt. It, it led to huge diplomatic blowback. You know, you had almost 200 Russian intelligence officers expelled all throughout North America and Europe in reaction to this. Much more dramatic, much more kind of uh, retaliatory measures were taken than anything that happened after the murder of Alexander Litvinenko in 2006. And so isn't the question, well, they, they screwed up, right? except that they really didn't. And they didn't because if you're working for one of Putin's spy services today, you now know if you defect, if you become an informant for a hostile power, particularly the United States or the UK, one day, even if you go to prison in Russia, even if you're convicted and, and sentenced for treason, highest crime there is, one day you might wake up and you know, collapse on a park bench somewhere because you've been poisoned with something that, that really almost has no antidote. And it was cooked up in a a military lab somewhere in Siberia. There's a deterrent factor to what they're doing as well. Right. No, Um, I completely, completely agree. They really, I mean, they sent the message loud and clear with the attempted assassination of the Russians in the UK and and others. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what they're doing in these countries. So this is what happened in Syria. Essentially, Syria was a declared Russian military intervention. 2015, Putin gets up before the UN, basically says, we built this base in Latakia. We're going in to fight ISIS. Of course, what they didn't do was fight ISIS, at least not in the main, in in the early part of their intervention. They went after rebel groups that posed a more imminent threat to the Assad regime, particularly those that had been recruited or run or armed by the United States under the CIA program. But Putin also wages what I would call a plausibly deniable intervention all throughout the world. And the easiest way to do that is to use mercenaries, because if if mercenaries get caught or if they get killed, the Russian defense ministry, the Russian foreign ministry, the presidential administration can all say, well, these guys are just volunteers, patriots who went on holiday and, you know, took up arms on behalf of their compatriots, which is literally what they say. It's like Mission Impossible. Goes right. Like Mission Impossible, (laughs) right, disavowed, or actually not even ever avowed before. So it's, you know, we don't, we have nothing to do with them. So what happened in Syria was a deal was struck by the Russian government to give the members of Wagner, I think it was a 25% stake in any oil and gas fields that they recovered from ISIS. 
So these guys, in their infinite wisdom, decided to go for the Conoco gas plant, which happened to lie east of the Euphrates River Valley in Deir Zor, province of Syria, and also fell under the de facto American protectorate because you had a consortium of different countries intervening in Syria all at once. The American zone was east of the Euphrates River. Nobody would go in there and, you know, that's what the so-called deconfliction mechanism with Russia was about. And, you know, it's still, this is very murky as to what exactly happened and more to the point who was involved. We know that some Wagner mercenaries were embedded with pro-Assad forces. Now, whether these were Syrian Arab army forces, whether these were Hezbollah, whether these were Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps officers or their proxies, we don't know. But we know that some Wagner were involved. And they kept approaching American positions, or better say, SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces positions. The Americans kicked through the deconfliction mechanism, told the Russians, back off, back off, we will retaliate if you provoke us. And they just pushed on through. And so if you look at the communications coming from Wagner back home to central base, it sounded like Stalingrad. We've been slaughtered. They used helicopter gunships. They used fixed wing aircraft. The Americans just, they, they completely wiped us out. And I, I remember speaking to one former National Security Council member who said, to be honest, we don't even know how many Russians were killed in this skirmish or this confrontation because the satellite footage, it was, it was like hamburger meat everywhere. Wow. You, you couldn't reconstruct the, uh, the order of battle. Well, it sounds um, like it couldn't, however, have happened, couldn't have happened to a nicer group of people. So, well, okay, indeed. So, and, so, one, mm-hmm. so these guys get killed. They report back in messages back home that they were absolutely slaughtered. The U.S. gave them warning to stop. And then, mm-hmm. you know, when they didn't, they went to the Russians. So one of the stories that these mercenaries put out is, well, the Russians were actually setting us up. Right. We weren't there working for Putin. That's not what we do. We were set up by the Russian military that's jealous of us or something like that. Is that even credible? Could these guys be on the ground in Syria or Libya or the Central African Republic or in Hungary or wherever else they are without Putin's okay? I mean, look, my my the supposition as to why, why use them and why make them do something so catastrophically self-destructive as, as to go after the United States like that. Well, number one, there was the financial imperative, right? We're going to pay these guys money, but only money that they earn for themselves, i.e. by capturing the hydrocarbon infrastructure in Syria and taking it from the Americans. Two, the Russian military is not going to get into a shooting war with the United States military because the United States military would destroy the Russian military. In Syria, I mean, the, the entire... Russian intervention in Syria could be liquidated probably in 24 hours by the United States. Of course, we're not going to do that, but the Russians know we could do that. So using, again, these sort of cutouts, the, you know, plausibly deniable thugs and goons to do your bidding or to at least see what the U.S. response is going to be makes a lot of sense. It was in in, in a way, I, I, I consider this operation to have been a kind of probing exercise well, let's see how far we can push the Americans before they push back. It, it also, to my mind anyway, gave the lie to what is one of the sort of big information warfare conceits coming out of Moscow and, and was used, instrumentalized in the 2016 election, is used all the live long day whenever there's a question or debate about what we should do to deter or contain Russia, which is World War III, right? Dare to do anything, poke the bear, and it's going to be World War III. Well, the bear got slaughtered <laughs> in the desert of the Middle East. And instead of World War III, it was, it's the Eddie Murphy line from Raw. Wasn't me, you know? <laughs> I mean, total disavowal by the Kremlin. Very interesting. It goes to show that you can retaliate to some degree, at least when it comes to these private military contractors, and do so with impunity and not risk any kind of escalation. So these guys are in more than a dozen countries. They're in Mozambique and Central African Republic. Can you give us a picture of what they are doing around the world? I myself haven't been able to track all of their activities in places like Mozambique and and CAR. But let me give you an example of of a story I did, which consisted of or was based on leaked internal communications from Wagner. Really, though, not Wagner per se, not the mercenary arm, but what was known euphemistically or just as a kind of shadowy catch-all as the company. And the company stands for Prigozhin's Network of Operatives, be they military or and I'll come to this, political technologist. Uh, this, the country that, that I looked at was Libya. What we found, and these were 
email correspondences, but more to the point, slideshows, PowerPoint presentations, memos that were drafted, in some cases by authors who were able to identify based on the metadata. So you know, you can open up a Microsoft Word document and see who the author was. And these, the authorship corresponded to known Prigozhin employees who've been reported about elsewhere in other parts of the world, such as Ukraine or Syria. What we found was, you know, Wagner has kind of graduated from guns for hire into becoming a political lobbying and almost like a McKinsey on steroids kind of consultancy. So they go around... McKinsey with guns. <laughs> or Paul Manafort, but even worse, if you can believe such a thing or imagine such a thing. They go around to mostly developing countries, countries with active armed conflict, such as Libya, which is in the midst of a civil war. And they offer their services to warlords and or aspiring politicians. And this is, what, this is really remarkable. And it, it sort of speaks to the Russian way of doing interventions as opposed to the American or the British or the Western way. So in Libya, right now, I mean, there's a, there's a host of different factions, but two of the main ones are run by General Haftar who is a long-standing Libyan warlord, used to be backed by the CIA when Muammar Gaddafi still drew breath, now is backed by France, the United Arab Emirates, and Prigozhin, but with an asterisk there. So let me come to that. The other big faction is the one that belongs to Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, the son of Muammar Gaddafi. The Wagner guys, the, the Prigozhin guys, come to Libya, and they decide, we will work with everyone and anyone we will work both for them and against them. So in other words, they signed up with Haftar, they signed up with Saif al-Islam Gaddafi to do social media operations, similar to the, the troll farm stuff, creating Facebook forums that seem to look like genuine, authentic Libyan social media presences, but are actually run by these Russian operators to push propaganda. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi is the future of Libya. He's the next best thing. He's the new hope, blah, blah, blah. Muammar Gaddafi was a great leader who was ignominiously lynched by NATO and an American-led intervention, blah, blah, blah. They do polling. What is the word on the street? Who supports whom here? Who has the best chance of becoming president in an election? Who should we be backing? So they're basically the James Carfields and Mary Madelines of Libya? But they're very, very honest. I mean, I mean, like startlingly so about the political fortunes and the capabilities of the people that they're working with. So, for instance, we had a memo where it was a very unvarnished and unflattering portrayal of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi. He was basically a distracted little boy, couldn't sit still, couldn't, couldn't hold his attention for more than five seconds. And they basically said, if we want to make this guy president, we're going to have to babysit him. Then they talk about General Haftar and they say he is a paper tiger. Worse than that, he's really like a busted flush as a warlord. He claims to be doing X, Y, and Z. He's making a, a, a concerted military push to retake Tripoli. He can't do any of that. And he talks a big game. He's also duplicitous. He's talking to the French. He's talking to the Emiratis. He'd probably talk to the Americans if they'd give him the time of day again. We don't like him. We don't trust him. But he's a client, so we'll work for him. And if he's going to be president, we have to do the following, including, by the way, and they, they admit this nakedly in their memos, including rig an election. To make him president. But then they say, you know, Haftar is going around saying that Wagner mercenaries, our guys, are embedded with his paramilitary force. It's not true. He's going around taking pieces of paper and drawing Russian license plates on them and affixing them to his military vehicles to project this image of total Moscow-backed patronage. Not true. And we're going to show him something. We're going to teach him a lesson. So the Prigozhin people imported Sudanese Janjaweed mercenaries, Janjaweed genocidaires. Janjaweed in Sudan were the ones responsible for the genocide in Darfur in the 90s, right? They imported these guys into Libya to fight General Haftar's forces. So in other words, their client, their proxy, they're both working for him, and then they're bringing in other external actors to slaughter him. Okay, so I've got to interrupt you here. If you came to me well-known Hollywood mogul and said, I have this movie treatment and it involves this group and they're doing this and that and this and that and that and this and this head fake. And I just tell you, dude, come on, this is never going to fly. This is not credible. Not <laughs> realistic. This couldn't have possibly well, happened. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny you say that. I lived in Hollywood for 18 months and I pitched a show, not, I mean, not about Russian mercenaries, but 
a kind of satire on, on how basically Trump Russia, but told from the Russian side. And I said the only people who could do this with any artistic panache and, frankly, credibility are the Cohen brothers or Armando <laughs> Iannucci, right? <laughs> But this couldn't possibly be just Prigozhin coming up with these ways, okay, we'll play this faction against this faction. This has to be coming from the Kremlin, doesn't it? I mean, this kind of... Yes, it is. This, and, this, and this is not Prigozhin, just really creative entrepreneur. This is Russian no, and I, policy. I know, for, I know for a fact that Prigozhin is in, or he was. I, he, there's a question now as to, well, several actually. One is, is he still alive? There was a rumor that he had died in a plane crash uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I don't think he's made a public appearance in several weeks. Number two, is he in ill odor with the Kremlin because of this disastrous operation we discussed in Derizor, Syria from last year? And number three, even more interesting is, look, he's not the only game in town. You know, you, you Are there other mercenary want... groups like this? There, there are other branded PMCs, and the question PMCs is, are well, what? I mean, maybe private military uh, contractors or, or companies, I think. Uh, and, it, you know, the question is, is Prigozhin running all of them or are they being run by other oligarchs who have been assigned this task by the Russian government? You know, the, the cliche has been over the last several years, well, this sounds just like uh, the, the Russian version of Blackwater. Ah, just well, what I was about to but, ask you. Is this, is you this know, the Russian version of Blackwater? No, in order for it to be the Russian version of Blackwater, Blackwater's headquarters, their training grounds, will be, you know, a stone's throw away, like across the street from Fort Dix. Or it, it's going to be stationed in an American military training facility. And, and also in Russia, these things, that just doesn't happen. First of all, again, mercenaries are illegal in Russia. So you're talking about a technically criminal enterprise, but a criminal enterprise that sets up shop or that's training its, its goons right behind a GRU Spetsnaz facility? one of the most closely and, and you know, carefully guarded installations in the country, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. So the question is, is Wagner, is Prigozhin, is his patronage system run by the GRU? Or, again, it's Russia. It could be sort of a, a hybrid or a hodgepodge. Is he sort of an oligarch who runs a disinformation facility in the troll farm and a consortium of different mercenary groups that can be dispatched, particularly to uh, health spots in Africa or the Middle East, can sign, by the way, conduct transactions for military hardware to be sold by the Russian Defense Ministry to these countries, so they act as emissaries. I mean, we all have our theories, and, and mine tends to be, again, just because of the predominance of the GRU and their kind of their, their marquee value right now, I would be very surprised if there wasn't some collaboration or conjunction between Prigozhin's quote-unquote company and Russian military intelligence. Okay, so exit question for you. Mm -hmm. What are we supposed to do about this? If you look around the world, these kinds of proxy forces, which I, I tend to associate with Iran, because Iran has really made an yeah. art of this with Hezbollah, with the mm -hmm. Houthis, with Hamas, with the PMUs in Iraq. Okay, these are unbelievably dangerous. We don't know what to do about them. And we tend to label countries that operate them as basically state sponsors of terrorism. What are, yeah. we, what are we supposed to do about the Wagner Group and its ilk? What's the choice for the U.S.? Well, I mean, first, we have to make an appraisal of, again, what they're up to now, or, or better say, what their standing is in the Kremlin. If they've become a self-correcting problem in that they've overextended, they've gone too far, and Putin is, wants to wash his hands of them, well, then you don't have to do much, but you do have to be aware of the fact that others will come in to take their place, right? Um, well, isn't that what's happened to some one... extent? So you've got like SHIELD and Patriot, these other groups that have sort of come up to compete with them, isn't there? Aren't there now proliferation of some of these uh, mercenary groups? Yeah, totally. But I mean, Wagner, they were the pathfinders, right? They kind of built the way forward. So look, I've asked this question. I don't really think there's, a, particularly in the U.S. government, a, a way of dealing with this. Because again, you know, if these guys are, quote unquote, private citizens, if they're, um, you know, an, a corporation, the first way to try and, and deal with them is to go to Russia and say, here's evidence of, you know, your citizens, your, your nationals, committing atrocities or engaged in some unlawful activity, you need to investigate this. And the Russians will pat you on the head and say, sure, you're, we'll investigate it. So again, the, the, the deniability factor works to the Kremlin's advantage. And again, it, it is also part of the way that they do things. You know, they will brazenly intervene and leave signatures of their intervention all over the place. 
you call them on it, and they sort of they deny it, they deflect, they say, no, actually, you did it, or these guys did it, or space aliens did it, or the Israelis did it, or the Ukrainians did it. But then they sort of smirk and, and wink and, you know, basically acknowledge to you that, yeah, we did it, and, and, but you can't prove it because we did it so, so cleverly or carefully. You know, even Bob Mueller didn't, didn't prove the IRA was run by a Russian intelligence service. He's just gone after the subsidiaries, the LLCs that were created to essentially kind of launder this, this intervention. Oh, this is an incredible story. So I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, this is an incredible story. I can tell you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I I know we're going to want to follow up and and talk to you again sometime. And I think you need to hold out for either Tom Cruise or Daniel Craig to play you in the movie because (laughs) this is... Well, you know... Woody Allen is probably closer to <laughs> <laughs> No matter what, we'll be there to watch it. Thank you, if, Michael, if so you much. If you want to ask Daniel Craig to do it, by all means, I'll, <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. I'll <laughs> do it right after we get off this. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks a ton. So much. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Okay, Danny, that was really cool. <laughs> that was that was like That was cool that time, not fascinating. Oh, stop it. But look, it's labyrinth like almost. There's this whole you know, you lift up the rock that is the former Soviet Union slash Russia, and there's all these tunnels and things going on, people creeping around doing nefarious stuff, and he's tracking all of it and uncovering all this. And as you said, I mean, if you took this to a Hollywood producer, they'd kick you out because they say it's too it, it's not crazy. credible. No one, it's not incredible. credible. <laughs> no one be- would believe it, but it's actually happening. They're sending mercenaries into dozens of countries. With, M- carrying, with WMD? With WMD. They're, they're carrying out assassinations around the world with WMD. You know, anyone who says, like, the Cold War is over, well, maybe for us it is. <laughs> the Russians are still fighting the Cold War. So that's really my, my sort of exit question as we, you know, back clean up on this podcast, which is, what are we supposed to do about this? Because if we, it seems to me, yes, it was salutary that we chopped those guys into so much hamburger, and I have not an ounce of regret for it, and I'm glad that Jim Mattis ordered it, and I'm delighted it happened. But i got to ask myself, if we don't do something systemically to fight this, every country, every bad guy country, the North Koreans, the Chinese, the Russians, you know, others are going to have these proxy armies as well. Well, we only cut these people down because they came at us, right? right. Like, you know, if we, if they were, they, they approached a U.S. position in Syria and, and wouldn't, and wouldn't they, back we, off. We fired warning shots. We called the Russian command and said, call your people off. And they ended up, they kept pushing. And so they got slaughtered. And that's perfectly fine. So what should we do? Well, I don't know what we can do because it, unless we want to set up a contrary proxy force to go around and fight them. And, you know, it's interesting because in some of these cases, they are there to carry out Russian policy, right? In other cases, it sounds like they're there just to make money. Why are they in 20 African countries? Because they're trying to get control of gold and oil and energy, partly on behalf of the Russian state, but also to enrich themselves. There's this whole crony capitalist oligarch thing going on in Russia where they have all sorts of illegal means of making money, and Putin's making his billions of dollars under the table, and the Russian oligarchs and the generals, I'm sure, are making billions of dollars as well, just like they invented. Venezuela, all the generals are billionaires. And I think these mercenary forces are not just an arm of Russian policy. They're an arm of Russian crony corruption around the world. You know, the more I think about this, AI has done some work on on the nexus between corruption and terrorism and dictatorship. Mm -hmm, But I mean, this is another element of it. And the right answer in these cases is transparency, right? The right answer is, oh, okay. You have billions of dollars? Where do you keep them? Because I want to know who that account belongs to. I want to know who's running that. I want to know whose soldiers are there. I want to see whose planes are flying in. Because we didn't even ask Michael this, but you and I were wondering, right? How do they get their equipment into these countries? Yeah. They don't have planes. They don't have military transports. They don't have they C-5 do. skis. Well, I'll tell you the answer to that question, which, which has been a theme of ours as two former congressional staffers, is, well, we ought to investigate. There ought to be hearings about this. You should have like a, a Senate Intelligence Committee or the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee or one of these committees do a deep dive into the Russian military contractors and team up with somebody at 60 Minutes to do a documentary about this and get the word out. Exactly. Uh, there's this is These are all knowable things. Oh, my God. I would so watch that hearing and watch that documentary. Okay. And that movie. Uh, 
and that movie. Okay, Elliot Engel, Jim Risch, Frontline, 60 Minutes. You're getting your ideas here. We look forward to watching. That was great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 